Western civilization, how much do you know? My name is Russell Miles and this is the 39th episode of our Western Civilization series. In the previous episode we looked at the development of nuclear weapons. In this episode we'll follow the evolution of nuclear doctrine. In a very early episode I mentioned that the UK used the equivalent of a bicycle lock to secure airdrop thermonuclear bombs. Displayed behind me are various switches and controls used by United States combat aircraft during the Cold War that would activate various airdrop nuclear devices. In most cases there is a strain of wire that would break if the switch was operated. From that point it was the pilot's discretion as to how they might attack their assigned target. This might be troop concentrations, chemical weapons storage and airbase. The target may be moving and the pilot must confirm the target, perhaps attack an alternative target if the primary one could not be located. I would stress that most of these switches were on single seat strike aircraft. These aircraft were kept in secure hangars, a senior officer and another designated officer would both have to receive coded authentication messages before they directed the pilot to take off for a mission. There were guards patrolling both inside and outside. They had the task of both protecting the pilot and aircraft and to prevent the pilot taking off without valid authorization. Multi-crewed aircraft might take off with nuclear weapons on board. These included maritime patrol aircraft which carried nuclear depth charges. At least two of the crew had to agree if the nuclear weapon was to be deployed. In the later part of a Cold War, it was very rare for any aircraft with nuclear weapons that could be detonated by the crew to be kept airborne they would await coded authorizations to take off with such weapons. As I also mentioned, the codes eventually became linked to the Pacific weapons so air crews could never independently operate them. We are at peace with ourselves and impossible to destroy. Peter Arcady Wigan or Locke, Orson's Got Cars novel Ender's Game. At various times, defense policy makers in the West expressed that they might fight a limited nuclear war. This was to leverage precision guided missiles to target specific targets. There had been earlier idea called Counter-Strike, no cities. This was to only target strategic military assets. The belief was that this would motivate the opposing power to relocate such facilities out of urban areas. However, policy makers in the USA and the USSR never gave much credence to limited nuclear attacks, as such attacks would engender a massive nuclear retaliation anyway. Robert McNamara was the US Defense Secretary from 1961 to 1968. During the Second World War, he was one of several academics assigned to assess the effectiveness of the strategic bombing campaign. At one stage, he advised that the more advanced B-29 bombers be devoted to the air war against Japan, even though the Japanese air defense was relatively inferior to the German air defense forces. The reasoning being that while the German fighters might intercept both B-29 and the older model B-17 and B-24 bombers, the Japanese would struggle to intercept the high-flying B-29s so overall losses would be lower. However, air commanders in East Asia were to abandon precision daylight raids for night attacks at lower levels using fire bombing. As US Defense Secretary, McNamara sought to rationalize the competing strategies where the respective armed forces were developing different rockets and aircraft to attack the Soviet Union. McNamara pursued developing solid fuel Minuteman ICBMs deployed in protective silos, initially with a one megaton warhead. At the time, the administration was being politically criticized about a so-called missile gap compared with the Soviet Union. McNamara settled on having a thousand Minuteman missiles because this was a suitable round number and sufficient to counter criticism. There was no real military rationalization as to how many missiles were sufficient. Soviet Chairman Nikai Khrushchev was to boast that Soviet rockets were coming off the production line like sausages. US intelligence agencies had estimated that the Soviets had 36 liquid-fueled intercontinental missiles by early 1960, reaching 100 by mid-1961. In the summer of 1956, a US Navy-sponsored study was advised that a one megaton warhead of much reduced weight would be available within five years. This spurred the idea that such a missile deployed from a submarine would be effectively invulnerable 
and carry sufficient explosive force to destroy Soviet cities with the accuracy of missiles at the time. The USSS George Washington was launched in 1959 and was the first of 40 ballistic missile submarines launched by 1966. Each submarine could carry 16 missiles. The submarine's base nuclear deterrents made redundant land-based missiles. However, the USA, Soviet Union and France, and later China, were to maintain highly vulnerable bombers for many years and still have land-based missile systems. By the 1970s, the United States had 30,000 nuclear weapons, so many that the Joint Strategic Targeting Planning Staff allocated warheads way beyond what was required. The commander of the United States Strategic Air Command, General Lee Butler, 1992-1994, observed that one in ten of the thousand Minuteman ICBM missile force was targeted against the Soviet anti-ballistic missile system. Furthermore, 69 warheads were targeted against the Soviet ABM radar at Punskum near Moscow. This meant that over 100 thermonuclear warheads would detonate in and around Moscow and against defensive as opposed to offensive systems. On 25 July 1980, President Carter approved Presidential Directive 59, which was described by Secretary of Defense Harold Brown as a codification of the prevailing policy, stating they had the means and the detailed plans to ensure that the Soviet leadership know that if they choose some intermediate level of aggression, we could, by selective, large but still less than maximum nuclear attacks, extract an unacceptable high price in the things the Soviet leaders appear to value most. Secretary Brown insisted that the countervailing strategy was not a first strike strategy. In the 1980s, Australian political scientist Desmond Ball postulated that limited nuclear war was not possible. This was because any initial nuclear attacks would target command and control assets and surveillance systems such as radars. This would render political and military leaders both blind and out of control in the midst of a crisis. In such circumstances, there would be a tendency to launch nuclear missiles before they were destroyed. Other countries with nuclear weapons would also launch their missiles out of fear that they were being targeted. Political leaders might seek to use nuclear attacks to broadcast their intentions, e.g. destroy one or few cities or military bases, hoping an enemy would realise that they will destroy more if they continue to attack. This crude mode of communication would see what Desmond Ball called sporadic nuclear exchange over days, weeks, months. There may not be a massive nuclear retaliation, but prolonged exchanges whose cumulative effect would destroy civilization. The emergence of missile defence systems would little change these equations. Desmond Ball's theories influenced nuclear powers, particularly the USA, to play down limited nuclear warfare. The USA and Russia pursued missile defence systems, but more due to the emergence of minor powers – Iran, North Korea, Israel, Japan, India and Pakistan – with ballistic missile technology. I had previously mentioned how troops, ships, aircraft have been arrayed as nuclear tripwires. For example, US soldiers deployed between Seoul and the North Korean border. To better understand the connection between nuclear and non-nuclear or conventional armed forces, consider that if a patrolling warship or aircraft were to be attacked, the attacking force must consider whether the opposing force might respond with a nuclear strike against their military base or some such target. This attack may come from an ally, in the case of most Western countries, the USA. While such a response would be most improbable, the remote chance of a nuclear exchange, which would be sure to become a sporadic nuclear exchange destroying civilization, would stop a decision by political and military leaders to attack at all. The other vital role of Western military forces is to protect the nuclear deterrent capability. I had earlier described how in the 1960s the UK deployed its fighter aircraft to protect nuclear bomber bases. Navy bases, radar installation, headquarters and such involved with nuclear assets are all closely guarded. As well, Grand Air and Navy forces are also to ensure that these assets are protected. Australia's Defence Force's key role is to guard sea lanes and military bases to be available to US military forces, which in turn protect submarine and air bases of their nuclear deterrent forces. So long as the US nuclear deterrence is secure, Australia is invulnerable to attack. This is the same for every Western country.
The conventional forces, infantry, helicopters, warships, are available for constabulary or lower level military intervention. But even these matters are fundamentally to prevent the strategic situation deteriorating and where nuclear weapons might be deployed. In the post-Cold War era, Western countries massively reduced their armed forces and focused more on expeditionary or air and sea deployments. During the Western intervention in Afghanistan, a military force of up to 100,000 troops was established in Central Asia for over 20 years. The countries involved continued to reduce the proportion of their economies devoted to the military over this time, from an average of 4% of GDP at the end of the Cold War to less than 2% along with reducing taxation and increasing spending on education and welfare. While the goal of creating a western orientated country in Afghanistan dramatically failed, there was no other major power or alliance capable of such an operation. This intervention was also in areas of interest of major powers of India, Russia and China. At the fall of the Soviet Union, Russian troops deployed to retrieve nuclear, chemical and biological weapons from the new successor states of Belarus, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Ukraine, Uzbekistan, where such weapons had been based. There were also technical advisers of the United States, Germany and other European countries. In Syria, Russian troops removed chemical weapons during their ongoing conflagration. Were a nuclear armed country to fall into communal conflict, Western powers would seek to secure any nuclear device. This would entail negotiations as to final custody and destruction, which may include armed intervention and military operation. In the next episode, we'll further explore the politics of Western defence and the integral role of nuclear armaments. If you like this channel, please subscribe and tick like. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I can be contacted at email russmills at iprimus.com.au. Thanks for listening.